don't cover your ears, I'm not gonna sing, don't worry. <laughs> Could you please hold it for me for yeah, 10 minutes? I do. <laughs> no, it worked. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So I'm a memory I'm a memory researcher and during my PhD I worked on different types of memories. And tonight I'd like actually to share with you two different types of memories. And this is the first have you ever had a very bad memory, a traumatic one, like an accident or maybe a harsh breakup that you would like to get rid of without affecting other memories you cherish? Can I see show of hands, please? Well, as expected, so many of you. Keep your hands up, please. As expected, so many of you. So, could I please, could I please ask you, for those who raise your hands. Could I please ask those who raised your hands to look here and all the others cover your eyes, please? But wait a minute here. Wait a minute here. Is it really possible that we can get rid of memories? or it's just crazy notion from sci-fi movies? Well, before I answer this question, let me first take you through the process of how memory researchers, including myself, study memory. There are different types of memories, but we mostly care about emotional memories, because simply if you combine an emotion to a memory, it burns into your brain and can literally persist with you throughout your entire life. Emotions, like happiness, Sadness, <laughs> or maybe fear. <laughs> so let's take fear as an example because it's very easy to induce in the lab. And to do so, we bring our daily collaborators, the lab animals. <laughs> we put these lab animals into a box. This box they have never been into before. So as a first reflex, they like to explore it moving everywhere. But after a while, we give them a very weak electric shock in this box that it's mild but enough though to make them associate this box with the harmful cue so every single time you put them back into the box they remember that the box is harmful and they freeze and they refuse to move out of fear great now we have successfully created a field memory is it possible that we can get rid of it well it turns out that amongst the known treatments there is exposure based therapy where you have to confront your fear in order to be able to get rid of it. And this is exactly what we do with the lab animals. So we bring them back into the box. Initially, they remember that the box is harmful and they refuse to move. But when we put them back into the box, several sessions a day, for many consecutive days, the fear tends to go down. That's known as fear extinction. Unfortunately, this fear extinction training is unsuccessful if the animals are not receiving it on a regular basis. So if you put them back again into the box, when they are not doing this kind of a fear extinction training on a regular basis, then the fear comes back again. What's known as spontaneous recovery of the fear. But the good news here is, from our own research in the lab, we have found out that there is a specific drug. If the animals are taking this drug while they are doing the fear extinction training, the fear never comes back again. So in conclusion, and to come back to my first question, with this approach, we believe that it's quite possible to get rid of traumatic memories. And for all of you who've raised your hands in the beginning, hoping to get rid of your own traumatic memories, don't worry at all. Soon, we will have the means to. <laughs> Imagine with me the following scenario. You decided, for whatever reasons, that you rob a bank. <laughs> While inside the bank, ordering the banker to fill your bags with the money, 
you suddenly realized that your rubbing mask is still in your hand. <laughs> that, that's quite embarrassing, right? <laughs> so you quickly get your rubbing mask and then you pull it over your head. And then you look for your gun to discover that you, oops, forgot it with your partner who's waiting for you outside in the car. <laughs> At that point, that's an utter failure. This is not a joke. It happened in real life in Auckland, New Zealand. It was referred to as the most amusing robbery ever. Where the people and the banker were giggling, giving the money to the robber. Who, by the way, got arrested with his accomplice two hours later after fleeing with the money. So what happened with our incompetent robber here is called absent-mindedness, where you simply forget what you initially planned for. But sometimes, forgetting to remember is by far better than recalling a memory that never happened. <laughs> Allow me to explain. In 1975, Melbourne, Australia, a lady got raped but she gave a vivid description of the perpetrator to the police, leading them to his door. When they arrested the guy, he had a bulletproof alibi. It turned out that this guy is the psychology professor Donald Thompson, and at the same exact time, when the crime took place, he was on live TV, <laughs> being interviewed by a police commissioner <laughs> discussing memory distortions. So what really happened was she was watching this show. The real rapist broke into her place and did what he did, and she mistakenly developed a false memory. So now, if you think that developing a false memory is something infrequent in nature or exclusive to people with memory impairment, maybe you should think again of how many times you were dead sure of switching off the lights or the TV at your place, and then when you return back, you find that they are still on. Research has shown that there is no correlation whatsoever about your degree of certainty concerning a certain memory and this memory being true. So the bottom line here is we all do create false memories on a daily basis, mostly about trivial things, but if in a courtroom and your own life is on the line because of one of them, then we have to pay more attention to this matter. In the States, there are around 300 people who were convicted based on a false memory of a witness. And after spending up to 30 years Behind bars, they were proven innocent by DNA testing. That's quite alarming. And this is exactly why memory researchers are studying memory in the lab. But before I tell you how memory researchers are studying false memories in the lab, let me first do a simple exercise with you. I'll read out loud two word lists, and then we'll ask you a couple of questions afterwards. The first word list, candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, tart, pie. The second word list. <coughs> Mad, wrath, fear, hate, fight, rage, hatred, temper, mean, fury, ire, emotion, enrage. So now please raise your hand if you remember that the word sweet was on the first word list. Keep your hands up, please. Now raise your other hand if you remember that the word anger was on the second word list. Okay, that's the majority of you, and this is exactly how they induce a false memory in the lab, because neither of these words was on either of these lists. <laughs> so after the volunteers take the very same exercise like you did, they go inside a big, <clears throat> a, a big brain scanner that can precisely measure the brain activation. And it turns out that the brain region responsible for recalling the false memory shows a very low activation upon recalling this false memory, like the word sweet, which was not in the list, when compared to the activation upon recalling a true memory, like the word nice, which was in the list and the indeed heard. So my take home message here is, by further developing this approach, it's quite possible to have a memory accuracy detector that can filter memories, true from phony. And since not all cases have evidence that's useful for DNA testing, this approach could definitely save lots of innocent lives in the courtroom. Dankeschön. Yeah.